We're talking Cleveland Browns football on the R Lads Football Network for the R Lads Football YouTube channel. And anytime we talk Cleveland Browns football, Fred Greetham is with us from the Orange and Brown Report. How's it going, Fred? Going good. Greg, good to be with you again. Yes. Uh, it's always nice talking football, especially, of course, with the Browns with you, Fred. And uh, we're going to talk about mainly our main topic, of course, is going to be uh, taking a look at the NFL draft for the Browns, even though they didn't have a first round draft pick. But we're going to go through their picks. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about the recent schedule release, um, ask you to give maybe a grade for the draft uh, and uh, maybe even a little bit of fantasy for any dynasty fantasy owners who are drafting rookies uh, or maybe even drafting later in the year for young players to see if uh, there's some Brown uh, players that might be blossoming in 2024. Okay, Fred. So first of all, uh, oh, and I want to remind everybody here at our lads to subscribe. Don't forget that share link. And uh, this is the guide that came out. This is the our lads draft guide. Now, also want to remind everybody that not only can you still get the Orleans draft guide, but this is last year's draft review guide. And that's the reason I'm doing these interviews uh, with uh, analysts like Fred. Fred's going to help me uh, information wise when I do my uh, do my article on the Cleveland Browns and the Orleans draft review guide. So we'll have a link in the description. You can find out how to order that. Uh, but let's go ahead, Fred. And first of all, um, let me start up by asking you, without a first-round draft pick, uh, how the Browns reacted, basically, to the draft. Well, you know, it's hard for me to be down on what they did when they're drafting 54th overall. And by the way, this this paid off as far as not the money, but the draft picks and the compensation on the Deshaun Watson trade. You know, they traded six picks, including three number one picks. And this was the last year of that payment. So your first pick was in the second round, 54th overall. It's kind of a crapshoot to even guess what they may do by then. But I actually, we did a show like this before. And I think I was the only one on the panel to predict Michael Hall. Uh, just because i little biased with Ohio State. Okay. But I just thought that. He could be, they have three 30-something defensive tackles. They're all pretty good. I mean, Dalvin Tomlinson, Shelby Harris, um, Maurice Hurst. And so when you look at that, you really need to get a little younger. And uh, they drafted Siaki Ika last year in the third round from Baylor. But he didn't really get on the field, so you don't really know how they're feeling about him. But they drafted Michael Hall, very quick, very good upside. Um, and I think was it Arius Smith and with Miles Garrett on the outside and Okoronkwo and Dalvin Tomlinson, teams are not going to be able to double team him like they did at Ohio State and Hall should get favorable matchups at with a guard one-on-one -on -one or a center one-on-one. -on -one. And I like his chances going up against them. Okay. I'm not trying to compare him at all to this player, but I covered a player with the Browns, very similar, Michael Dean Perry. Um, drafted about the same area from Clemson, and he was the same weight exactly as Hall. And he was very quick. And he really had a great career with the Browns. And I think with Jim Schwartz, here's a 20-year-old with the speed and the quickness from the inside that I think Jim Schwartz will be able to pick his spots. If you saw last year, Jeremiah Wusa Kormoa linebacker exploded the way Schwartz used him. And yep. the same thing could be said with Grant Delpit at safety until he got hurt late in the year. And so I think that he'll have – spots to use Michael Hall. He's weak against double teams because he's undersized, but he's very quick off the ball. And if you can move him around and get him in one-on-one -on -one matchups, I think the defense is going to have to pick their poison. Do you double team Smith? Do you double team Garrett and let Hall go one-on-one? -on -one? And so I like the pick. He's the only guy I would say that I think will be in the rotation 
from the draft pretty likely. Yeah, four, uh, excuse me, six total picks, mm -hmm. four on defense, uh, starting with Hall. And um, uh, then you take a look at, because we'll stick on defense uh, with their sixth round pick, because uh, six and seven, the two sevens, all, all three were defense. So you have Nathaniel Watson, Miles Harden, Jawan Briggs. So Watson uh, from Mississippi State, uh, we, we, you know, of course, Cleveland, like a lot of other teams, uh, well, actually, uh, <clears throat> I, I should ask you uh, because I know there, I was just about to say a lot of other teams going to two linebackers. The Browns have used two linebackers. It, what's the defensive um, scheme going to be this year? Or do you think that they're going to use more three linebackers or uh, will they still go back to two linebackers most of the time? I think they will um, in their base, you know, I have three out there last year. They had the middle with Anthony Walker and then Sion Taki Taki was on the early downs, okay. you know, on the strong side along with JOK. But they really want to play two linebackers most of the time. And I think that's JOK and Jordan Hicks. Um, because Jim Schwartz likes to play three cornerbacks or three safeties. You know, so he likes to have five defensive backs out there. And with four rushers, that leaves you two linebackers. One area they were exposed in the playoffs was they didn't have a lot of speed at linebacker. And um, they moved on from Taki Taki and Anthony Walker. And they have the athleticism in JOK, but I think they need some depth there. They added Jordan Hicks to kind of take the place of Anthony Walker kind of be the captain. He's a tackler over a hundred tackles the last five years. So I think he'll fill that role, but I think they, they want a little quickness. And I think the intriguing part of, of adding Nathaniel Buki Watson is I didn't know a lot about him, but you look at him sec defensive player of the year led the conference with 137 tackles, tied for the league lead in sacks with 10. Um, you're trying to figure out why was he available in the sixth round. Well, teams across the league are devaluating linebacker. In yep. fact, Andrew Barry even mentioned that they have not really put any assets, big money assets into linebacker. The, the most aggressive move they made was when they traded up in the second round to get JOK. And he's and and that to this day is really the most aggressive move, biggest money move they made. And so I think Watson could really find the field, especially in the um, new kickoff role. They're kind of looking for bigger guys in the shorter spaces, and he's a linebacker. Our lads, I think mentioned him. I, I wrote about it in the story when they drafted him, called him a tackling machine. Yep. And, and so, you know, I think that, and Andrew Barry compared him to Sion Taki Taki. So that's kind of a good comparison. So he may be able to get on the field. They didn't really replace Taki Taki. They added Devin Bush, but nobody really knows if it was to be a starter or, or just see what he has because he's not getting a lot of money. So I think Watson really has a good chance to get on the field, make the team and be on special teams and, and see some play on early downs, you know, depends on how he adjusts. But I like the pick when you're taking in the sixth round, you yes. wonder why, you know, was a guy in college for six years. So you kind of think, well, was he, you know, he wasn't that highly sought after for for NFL or what he said he was getting a free education and he really wanted to take advantage of it. When we talked to him, he came out of there with two degrees, including a master's degree. So not too many young guys are thinking about that. And you got to be kind of smart to get two degrees, <laughs> especially a master. So yes. after seeing him in rookie mini camp and talking to him, you know, I think it was well worth, uh, you know, the pick in the sixth round. So, again, sixth round, a lot of these general managers, pro personnel, 
they like to get the guys that are 20, 21, not the guys that are more like 23, you know, 24 years old. So I think that's why he was available. Couple that with the devaluation of linebackers. So I like that pick. Yeah, he doesn't uh, have a lot of special teams experience, but that doesn't mean that he, they can't turn into a valuable special teams player in the NFL. And um, who knows? It's uh, quite possible that the Browns have bigger aspirations for Nathaniel Watson uh, than just being a late round pick special teams type player. Uh, it's very possible that within the next year or two, because Hicks is up there in age, it's possible that they uh, look at Watson as an eventual starter uh, opposite uh, joke. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's also talk about the other two and Miles Harden and Juwan Briggs. So Harden and FCS corner and uh, cornerback was definitely something that was talked about quite a bit uh, after the season ended for the Browns uh, unceremoniously in the uh, Houston game. Uh, but what about Harden specifically uh, intrigues the Browns staff? You know, the, here's one of the fewer guys that, it, that just kind of specialized in the slot. The last two years at South Dakota, that's all he played. And uh, Greg Newsome kind of whined about being used in the slot a year ago. He accepted the role last year more because I think they told him that they would still look at him as an outside when it comes to payday. A lot of guys don't like to be the slot because historically they've been getting paid about half what the outside corners get. But we talked to Harden. He – um he really liked playing the slot. He played at a smaller school, like you said, FCS. He said he had his best game against Missouri SEC school. And I think that there's been some publications that felt like he might've been a steal, you know, in the seventh round. If you remember a couple of years ago, I think our lads was the only uh, um, guide that really dr had Martin Emerson listed higher than where the Browns got him in the third round. Most yeah. publications had him more like fifth, sixth, free agent type. And he's really moved into the second cornerback. I think he's ahead of Greg Newsome. So they're hoping maybe they can get a long-term slot corner out of Harden. He's a little bigger than you would think. He's listed at six foot. And so, um, you know, again, Andrew Barry has drafted a cornerback every year in his five years since he's been here. He has also drafted a wide receiver every year in his five years. He's also drafted an <laughs> offensive lineman. Those are the premium positions that he looks for. And I think with the cornerback, you have your top three. They picked up the option to Greg Newsom. So he's under contract this year and next year for 13 million. But that doesn't mean they're going to sign him to a long-term extension. And so this gives them this year and next year to see if Cameron Mitchell, last year's fifth round pick and this year's pick miles Harden or somebody else emerges and can be that longer term at, you know, at cornerback because in Jim Schwartz's defense, like I said, they're playing three of them basically like starters. So yep. you need to have, four or five good ones. Last year, they kept Khalif Halasi on the roster all year after claiming him in the final cutdowns. The Chiefs wanted to put him on the practice squad, so they have to like him. And so they're collecting young corners to not only for now, but for the future. So it gives them some options. And so Harden's going to get his opportunity I think he, he has a real good opportunity, if not to make the team, to be on the practice squad. Yeah, and uh, some more tidbits on his scouting report, um, being a, a physical player, very good in run support, um, could be a big nickel, could even be a safety. So that gives a lot of options, a lot of different options for uh, the coaching staff and how to use a player like that. And that's exactly what you want. You want a, pl a player that uh, can potentially fill a variety of roles until they figure out which one may be the best one for them. And I notice also that the last two players on defense we just spoke about are three-year starters. So um, uh, 
I don't know if that is something that you've noticed uh, is something that is important. Sometimes it's not uh, to some scouts, to some GMs. Uh, they don't really care. They just care about talent. Some do care about, well, I want to make sure he's a leader. He's a team captain. I want to make sure that uh, he's got a lot of experience, not just a one-year guy. Uh, do you see Barry? Uh, you just mentioned that he has uh, some similar uh, every draft uh, ways about him, offensive line, wide receiver, corner. Do you notice anything like that regarding whether or not he values experienced players uh, or not? He does. He usually has the guardrails, like I mentioned earlier, with the younger guys, the 21-year-olds. I mean, Michael Hall's 20. Um, they like to have him to be able to grow into it. Um, but yeah, leadership, he talks about it's big, but then when they get to the later rounds, I think sometimes it's more production. And so they went outside the guardrails with the six round pick like Watson. And I think maybe a little bit with Harden, uh, you know, a smaller school and Briggs, the, you know, there's a valued position, defensive line, three year starter. And, uh, you know, yeah, he, Briggs he meant- actually Briggs actually a five year starter. So you've got uh, Watson three years, Harden three years, Briggs five. That's a lot of experience uh, with those last three picks on defense. Yeah, and and so when you get drafted by the Browns and Andrew Barry, you usually have a pretty good chance to make the team. He has up until last year, anybody he has drafted basically in his five years was on the team you know, in some fashion. And okay. then that now they're in the decision-making because this roster is so strong that you're, you're replacing some of the earlier draft picks with later draft picks. You know, he moved on from people's Jones last year. It's one of the first guys that he moved on from in a trade. And so I think because this roster, I mean, they have over 40 of the 53 guys have guaranteed contracts. Okay. And so, you are really running out of room. It's going to be very tough for a rookie to make this team, even the draft ones. So you have to really look at the practice squad as places for these guys. And I think that's a perfect place for Javon Briggs. Um, You know, obviously they have to go through waivers and so forth, but they're collecting defensive linemen. Like I said, they put a premium on it and they have three at 30 or over and they're on one year deals, two of them. So, um, they're built to win now, but they're also an eye to the future. This draft really had an eye to the future. You know, like I said, Watson could get on the field and so could any of them. But as far as I really think it's more for the future, Hall has a probably the best chance to play this year. I think he'll be in the rotation injuries factor into all these things, but right now, I think a lot of this was value for the future. Yeah, when we talked about that uh, on one of our previous uh, uh, videos regarding the fact that if there was any team that went into the draft that could deal with not having a first-round draft pick based on their roster and how deep it was, it was the Cleveland Browns. Um, And that's why uh, you could say what you want about the trade, and I'm sure there's a lot of fans we know out there not happy with the whole Watson deal. Um, But it really has not affected Cleveland at this point. And uh, it's just about now finding out. We'll talk more about that during training camp and, of course, uh, during the season, whether Watson could stay healthy and finally uh, give Browns fans uh, the production that the Browns are hoping that he is going to be able to do. Um, I, I, I want to before we move on from from this, uh, I wanted to ask you about some of those other younger players now. So we mentioned Briggs, obviously, and Hall and and just talking about the, the defensive line. Uh, so you've got some other young players up there, uh, whether it's uh, Siaki from last year's draft, Alex Wright from the 2022 draft, uh, McGuire from last year's draft, um, Lonnie Phelps is a name. So uh, t- tell me about whether or not there's those players that I mentioned or maybe some other players I haven't mentioned, some young players that you think might be able to blossom and uh, take a step up this year. Yeah, Um when you look at the defensive line, edge rushers, a premium position, they, the biggest move and really the only move they made there was re-sign Zadarius Smith to a two-year deal. Um, that tells me they're very confident that Alex Wright is headed in the right direction. You know, as a rookie, I think third round pick, he had no sacks. Um, 
Last year, he had to have arthroscopic surgery after the first preseason game. He missed the rest of training camp, so he had a slow start. But by the middle of the season on, he stepped into the rotation, and he finished the season with five straight games with a sack. And and so I think he really solidified being the number four edge rusher behind Miles Garrett, Zadarius Smith, Obo Okoronkwo, and then you have Wright. And then he, Elijah or Isaiah McGuire last year, fourth round pick. He had one sack, played a little bit, but like most of last year's draft picks, if you looked on draft or on game day, almost all the inactives were the draft picks. Siaki Ika and McGuire and Luke Whipler, because they were so deep, yeah. they couldn't put them on the practice squad, but they couldn't get them active on game day. So McGuire, I think, will be in a battle to be the fifth. I think right now he's the fifth. They like Lonnie Phelps. He was at the rookie mini camp. They didn't really add um, anybody other than as an undrafted free agent. Okay. You know, they they um, will have some guys competing. But I think for the most, they like what they've seen of Alex Wright. And McGuire, we didn't see enough of him. We didn't see enough of Ika. Again, he was inactive every week pretty much. So it's going to be telling. They did add more on the defensive tackle, so that could be read that they're ready to – it'd be hard for me to believe they'd move on from Ika – you know, in the second year being a third round pick because yeah. most of us thought they'd move on from Anthony Schwartz earlier, but he was a third round pick and Barry kept him until the very end last year before finally moving on from him. So yeah, I think the defensive line's in good shape um, and they're pretty deep. In fact, um, some wonder with Michael Hall, you know, now are you going to have six defensive tackles or are you going to have yeah. to let go of a of a guy like Maurice Hurst that they brought back and they liked or or trade one of them maybe yeah. to get a position of need if there's an injury or something the one thing That's I'll right. say on the last comment last year the team was 11 and 6 in a very brutal division with five different starting quarterbacks so your yes. point about Deshaun Watson this roster is very good and I'm not taking anything away from Joe Flacco, but you just dropped him into a roster and an offense, and he hit the ground running. If Deshaun Watson can stay on the field, you have to believe that the offense can be as effective. And, and that's not to say Nick Chubb didn't play the whole season either. Yeah. So, so this is a very strong roster. Number four just has to stay on the field. Absolutely. And I look, I'm not a Browns fan, so I don't know <clears throat> what they're going through with Watson, but um, I think they're a little hard on him myself. I really do. Uh, and uh, I, 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 the way he fought through that Baltimore game, I don't think they give him any credit for that. I mean, that's tough football. I mean, well, he could have just that. said, no, I'm not playing. 14 for 14, 134 yards and a touchdown. And he was playing after the game. He found out on a high ankle sprain. And he had a broken bone in his shoulder that required yeah. season ending surgery. And he led him to a comeback victory over the Ravens on the road in Baltimore, which arguably was the best team in the regular season last yep. year. And they had the MVP quarterback. So I kind of agree, Greg. Everybody kind of puts the value of the contract on the expectations of the play. I think we're kind of, for the most part, past the, in Cleveland at least the Watson situation. Now they've paid the debt, so to say, with the draft picks. He's just got to stay on the field. Yes. And and I'll throw you a little tidbit. I've covered this team for a long time. 1980 was the last time the Browns had a quarterback that threw for 30 or more touchdowns. And even in the great year Baker Mayfield had when they went to the playoffs, he threw for 26 touchdowns. Okay. If Watson just stays on the field. His numbers, even last year, would extrapolate to over 30 touchdowns. Yep. He's going to be fine. He's 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 got everything needed. to. He's just got to stay on the field, even if he just plays a little bit above average. I know you didn't pay him to be that. You will get to the playoffs. 
But to get to the Super Bowl, he's going to have to play elite football somewhere down the line. And I don't see why he can't. They're, they, they are going back to his Houston roots where he led the NFL in passing with the spread offense under Ken Dorsey. I really think you're going to see that three, four, five wide receivers on the field and just pick and choose quick routes, get open, take your shot. So that's a little bit on that side. Sorry to interrupt you, but I just oh. think that this roster is strong. Yes. Last year, they were devastated with injuries. You take five starting quarterbacks on any team. You take out your <laughs> top three tackles. You take out your Pro Bowl running back. I don't know. You can just look at the Bengals when Joe Burrow went down. You can look yes. at any team. Look Who at the Jets. The, team, the last four teams standing all had their franchise quarterback and your Super Bowl champion, Patrick Mahomes, played the whole season. That's so it. the bottom line is you got to have your quarterback on the field for almost the majority of the season, especially in the playoffs. Yeah. I uh, We did a show on uh, Mark Lawrence from Playbook uh, Sports, uh, longtime uh, expert handicapper, and we do a show on uh, his website as well as, of course, his YouTube channel, Playbook Experts. And the last show we did, we would take a look at some of the futures – uh, and that's one of the ones that just blew up at me. I, I I could not believe the Browns were about 40 to one to win the Super Bowl. I was like, I'm getting that bet in now. I mean, that's nuts. I don't know what they're thinking, putting the Browns at 40 to one to win the Super Bowl. But, you know, this is the NFL. You know, if you have a bad year, uh, it's almost like you have to prove it sometimes. Uh, but that's good for people who want to wager, I guess, on, on futures. Because if uh, you're a Cleveland Brown fan, you have a kind of optimism. But obviously, Fred and I are showing. Uh, check that out. If they're still 40 to 1, grab it now. Okay. Um, well, they the have last- the toughest schedule in the NFL, you know, right now. Obviously, when you get to the regular season, it's never the same as what it yeah. is in May. Teams you thought would be good falter, there's injuries and so yep. forth. I remember last year they were going to play a primetime game with the Jets, the next to the last, and it was billed like the Browns are going to have to beat the Jets to get to the playoffs. (laughs) And then Aaron Rodgers was out, and it was like – and the Browns had Joe Flacco going up against, I think, Trevor Simeon. So, I mean, (laughs) it's it's never the way you think. But with that said, you could make a case in the AFC North for every one of those teams to be right. first or every one of those teams to be last. That's and right. so, you know, that's the 40 to one where it comes in, I'm sure is because of those, you know, the schedule injuries and a lot also nationally, the perception of Deshaun Watson. I just think the Browns are still under the radar because nobody really knows how he's going to perform when he stays on the field. Yeah, and, and they are still the Browns. It's like it's like uh, it's like talking about the Jets. They're still the Jets. That whole it's the same old Jets. If it, it, I'm sure you get a lot of there, the same yeah. old Browns, and that's yeah. just the way it is. But again, like I said, you know, we can take advantage of that if they don't want to. Uh, they don't want to value the Browns this year. That's fine with us. Okay, uh, the last two picks on offense. Uh, you have the, the third rounder, Zach Sinner from Michigan. So they go Ohio State and then Michigan in the draft with their top two picks. Uh, uh, I know Zinter well, loves him. Uh, I know, of course, he's got to come back from injury, and I know he's not like this glamorous type of player. He's not this, like, insane uh, type of uh, athlete or anything like that. Um, uh, actually, I should say, uh, he, he, you know, the, the power game versus the athleticism, um, he, I actually value uh, his – power more than I do his athleticism. Um, but I, I think he is a complete type of offensive lineman. And I think uh, even though they got him in the spot that, that was uh, pretty much where most people thought he was going to go. Um, I think he is definitely a long time NFL starting offensive guard. Yeah. To me, he's a plug and play guy. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not a fan really of the Browns cause I cover them, but Ohio state, I am, I'll say that. And all you have to do is watch the last two or three years, the Michigan offensive line just steamroll the Buckeyes. The Buckeyes have all these glamour guys, the Marvin Harrisons, the 
C.J. Strouds, the Travion Henry, the the NFL, you know, skill set guys that you see on Sunday, but they got steamrolled by that big offensive line of Michigan, and I didn't know much about their names or their individuals. But when I learned that Zinter was the captain, the leader of that group, yep. um, that told me all I need to know. They have two Pro Bowl guards here with the Browns and Wyatt Teller and Joel Batonio. They're quite costly, but Batonio's entering his 11th year. I think he's made all pro seven straight years, but he last year is starting to have the injuries mount, and he didn't practice like the whole week, but played on Sunday. Okay. And you don't know. Joe Thomas retired after 10 years. And Batonio's coming back for his 11th. So you don't know if this is his last year or not. And I think when you got a guy like Zinter in here, he can definitely, like Dewan Jones last year, stepped in and played nine games immediately at well at, as a rookie at right tackle before he got injured. And Zinter, I think, if Teller or Batonio were to go down, I think he's the same type guy that can step in and once he steps in, he could be an eight to ten year, you know, solid player for you. Absolutely. Because because you you know, you got somebody six, six, three, ten. He's been a pulling guard playing at a in a pro style offense. That's what the Browns like to do. And so I just, you know, I just think it's a great pick. And I think obviously with, with two bones broken might have affected as a draft because he didn't work out at all. He didn't do yes. anything. And the Browns got him in the third round. He was at the mini camp for the first time. He was back on the field with his helmet and everything. And he said he felt great knocking off the rust. And I think right now that was like an orientation. So I think now he's, he's here, he's practicing and he'll be able to go through the mini camp and then training camp. And I think you got yourself a solid player, not flashy, but somebody that could replace, you know, one of those two guards going forward. They were very thin at guard. They re-signed last year's backup, Michael Dunn, but that's really the only guard they had. They signed JV and Cohen as an undrafted guy. He'll probably compete. I wouldn't be surprised if he sticks, yep. you know, at least on the practice squad, because I think he was supposed to be drafted by many uh, guides. And yes. so I think that you're trying to develop some future and there could be your future, you know, with Cohen and, and Zinter, your future guards, you know, right now, you know, they're paying over 10 million for both individually, Batonio and Teller. The Browns, by the way, have more 10 million plus players on their roster than any team in the NFL. And so that kind of tells you the roster they have. So, you know, yeah, I like the pick, and I think that that I don't know how you can go wrong. And one little other ironic story is Zinter broke his legs in two or his leg in two places, fibia and tibia, against Ohio State when Michael Hall rolled up on his ankle in that oh, game. And so okay. here you got the Browns' top two picks or teammates, and they were presented in a press conference together, you know, now they're bros as teammates. Sure. And uh, so it's kind of a little ironic that one guy who broke, you know, by accident, but <laughs> sure. ended up missing out on the playoffs and the national championship game because of that. He'd never missed a game until then. Yeah. Well, they're going to be button heads in practice again. So don't be rolling uh, over uh, <laughs> anymore. Uh, even though it was accident, uh, just kidding. Um, and you mentioned Cohen, uh, because by the way, I did notice, uh, and I was just uh, checking it out. Out of all six draft picks, uh, the five of them have started at least three years. So Thrash, Watson, Harden, uh, Zinter started four, Briggs started five, Hall is the, the least with two, but of course, he's also the most talented uh, of the group. So I think that's 20 the way, years old. Yes. He's there you go. So there's a reason for it. Yeah. And by the way, Cohen, three year starter, also played at Alabama. And I agree. I was surprised he wasn't drafted. He could have gone as high as the, uh, the fifth round. And uh, that that's definitely one of one to keep an eye on. I do have, of course, ask you before we move on to the last pick about Callahan. 
Um, it's a huge loss. There's just no question about it. He's the best in the business. So he's gone. Uh, what do you think that might do? I mean, you never can tell uh, who the next head guy is going to do at a position, but uh, what do you think about the new guy taking over as the line coach? Yeah. Andy Dickerson was here as an assistant offensive line coach in about 10 years ago. And then he went on and made his name with the Seahawks. He was known for developing, have pretty good offensive line. So he's well-spoken. It's kind of hard to replace Bill Callahan, but the Browns had Callahan under contract, but they were not going to stand in the way when his son wanted him to come down and join him. So yeah, it'll be a blow. I think more than anything, Kevin Stefanski liked to have, you know, he said his office on one side was Callahan, on the other side was Schwartz. So he had two former NFL head coaches, you know, right next to him. And he would go over into their office and ask for advice. And now you, you know, you brought in Mike Vrabel this year. He's he's in the building uh. as a consultant. So now you have kind of the similar situation. But I think Stefanski now is entering his fifth year. I think he appreciates all the help, but I think he's now ready to assume that CEO role completely and maybe even turn over the play calling to Ken Dorsey and and all the way across the line. So it'll be a blow, but I think they were able to really instill in a lot of these veteran offensive linemen how they want to do it, you know, Batonio and Teller yes. and Conklin and Wills and even Dewan Jones, all were under Callahan and they were able to be developed and, and understand that system. So we'll see how they tweak it with the new offensive look this year. But I think, yeah, just like anything, you kind of, you know, you're successful, you're going to move on. I mean, I think Jim Schwartz, a lot of people thought he might move on because the number one defense in the NFL, well, it's going against him. He's 56 and now they want their head coaches like in their thirties, it seems like. So the Browns were fortunate not to lose him. All right. Now the last pick is Jamari Thrash, the fifth round wide receiver. And even though he uh, ended his career at Louisville, uh, he played four years uh, in the Sun Belt at Georgia State. A lot of good production there. And really uh, what it looks like uh, when you take a look at his scouting report is an excellent route runner. That's really uh, what sticks out more than anything. But what also sticks out in a negative way, and maybe, of course, this is why he lasted as long as he did, was short hands, short arms, all that thing, uh, which is important to some players. Some players, they can get through that. But what about Thrash and uh, whether or not you think he's going to be able to stick? I'm sure he probably will. Like you said, they all seem to stick the rookies. Uh, but whether or not he not only just sticks, uh, but he can make uh, maybe a, a name for himself on this team within the next couple of years. Well, again, a guy with a lot of production, four years in college, but he decided he wanted to go up, play up. A lot of times guys go down. He wanted to get in a pro style offense. He went to Louisville and played in the ACC and had had more production there probably than he did at Georgia State. And so, again, he's known as being a separator, being able to find ways to get open. And I think I said all along, my top priority for the Browns was not to draft a wide receiver in the second round, but to trade for a veteran that could already step right in. Yep. They did for Jerry Judy. He was my third choice. He's more of on potential. I wanted somebody that's been there, done that, maybe a little higher level, but that's what they did. So you have Amari Cooper, Jerry Judy, and Elijah Moore as your top three. All came in trades. Now your fourth is Elijah or uh, Cedric Tillman, last year's third year, third round pick. The previous year, third round pick, David Bell. And those two are mainly battling for the four spot. I still think they could use a veteran guy at the fourth spot. Okay. But so far they have not chosen to bring anybody in. So right now I would say Thrash has a good chance to knock David Bell off the roster or or at least make it as the on the practice squad. I think Cedric Tillman is the favorite to be at least the fourth receiver. They really like him. I talked to Andrew Barry about that, and they're really high still on him. Um, 
And so I think Thrash, yeah, he's going to have a chance to compete there. And I think at, at worst he would be brought in on the practice squad um, because of his production again. Um, rookies, it seems like it takes a little while before they are able to go. That's why I would rather have a veteran. But, you know, like you said, a lot of production and um, a lot of experience in college, and that's almost, you know, kind of like a David Bell or Cedric Tillman, be able to see what they have when they get to training camp, and who knows. But when you're talking the fifth round, um, he drafted Donovan Peoples-Jones, and he was their number two receiver for three years. So anything goes, you don't know. It just depends on, you know, Bell and Tillman and where they're at. They did go out and sign an undrafted uh, from South Carolina, Amarian Brown, and gave okay. him 100, 150000 guaranteed to be a preferred uh, undrafted wow. free agent. Okay. So that tells – it's cheaper than drafting him in the seventh round, I believe. But still, that tells me they like him enough. Probably he's competing, and they probably like to keep him around on the practice squad as well. So, again, it's going to be a numbers thing. And injuries always play a part, but you have Cooper in this last year of the contract. You have Elijah Moore in the last year of his contract. So a lot of it will depend on what they think these young guys, and they're going to get the chance in the upcoming preseason training camp to see what they have. Okay. Uh, a couple more things on the draft. First of all, uh, if you had to give a grade, I'm not sure if you've done that yet, uh, what kind of a grade would you give the Browns? And we have to, of course, understand that it also in, involves the trade. So you can't just say, well, you know, uh, I'm going to give them a grade just for these picks. In general, what kind of a grade would you give the Browns for uh, this draft class and how they had to make a move in order to not have that first round draft pick? Well, you know, I, I would say B minus because you don't have a first round pick. You have to include, you know, the Deshaun Watson trade. So now that's paid for, you know, at least the compensation draft picks. But um, you don't have a first-round pick that's going to for sure help you this year. Like I said, this roster is pretty much set. So these six picks, I don't know if any of them will even play this year. Michael Hall yeah. is expected to be in the rotation, but he's coming in behind Dalvin Tomlinson, kind of a big money free, uh, free agent from last year. And Shelby Harris, probably their top graded defensive tackle, brought him back as a free agent, and Maurice Hurst. And so, at best, he's probably going to be fourth in the rotation, barring injury. And then you have last year's third-round pick, Siaki Ika. So, with that said, Zinter is expected to be a future pick. And then you have Thrash, like I just mentioned. Watson could get on the field on special teams, could even help because they're a little thin at linebacker. Again, at linebacker, I see that they could bring a guy in, you know, at training camp after they see what, you know, keep in mind, last year they didn't sign Shelby Harris until two weeks into training camp after they were in Greenbrier and they okay. evaluated and said, okay, let's, there's a bunch of 30 something guys out there. They did that a couple of years ago with Malcolm Smith. He was a linebacker that was available. They had an injury. They brought him in midway through training camp and he turned out to be the second leading tackler. Okay. So they could do that with wide receiver. They could do that with linebacker. They could do that with tight end. So all this is fluid. But when you look at that, I talked about Zinter. I talked about Thrash, Harden, same thing. These are all future prospects for the most part that could get moved up if injury occurs. But Briggs, same thing. I like what they did, thinking you got to address the future. And they have a good roster, but they have some guys that are getting late 20s, early 30s, and they got to make some decisions. They have the highest payroll in the NFL as far as cash. And, and as long as Jimmy Haslam keeps willing to spend – cash to restructure and pay it in upfront bonuses. They averaged last year paying about 50 million more in upfront bonus cash to, than any other NFL team. That's how they're able to have these 
you know, 10 million plus guys on the roster. So with that said, they have a, they can afford to develop because as they went into the off season, they had 19 of the 22 starters returning <laughs> yeah. from injury or whatever. And the three that they didn't retain, they let them go on their own. It wasn't like they said, Oh man, we really, they went out and replaced them in free agency. Okay, so uh, I have to then uh, uh, also ask you about – because you, well, is there a spot on the team as deep as this team is? And you've mentioned a few of them already, but just if you just had to just quickly um, uh, outline or, or just point out, okay, here's one or two spots that you would still like to see the Browns and you think that they're going to zero in on to improve their depth. Uh, it sounds like to me, again, whether or not you agree or they agree with you, wide receiver, maybe at a veteran – um, but if you had to just specifically uh, point out maybe one position that you think might be a little susceptible, barring injury, what would that be? Well, on offense, I'd say tight end. I mean, they let Harrison Bryant go. They have David N- Njoku who had a breakout season, went to the Pro Bowl, but behind him, you don't have much. You have Jordan Akins, who was supposed to be a, a fave of Deshaun Watson from Houston last year. I think he had 15 catches. <clears throat> so Harrison Bryant was more of the blocking role. So you really don't have much behind them too. You have uh, Zaire Mitchell Payton, who has been on the practice squad for a couple years. And you dra- you have an undrafted kid from Wyoming, Trayton Welch. So those two guys really right now are battling for the third. I think they could bring in either a, a, an unsigned veteran or trade um, one of their surplus areas like defensive line for a veteran tight end okay. or a veteran wide receiver or a veteran linebacker. Again, okay. I don't know if they're ready to turn over um, linebacker to Bookie Watson, a rookie. So again, they could bring in a linebacker to, to go with Jordan Hicks. You know, if they don't think Devin Bush is the player that he was when he was with the Steelers or, or whatever. And so, um, yeah, I would say backer on defense and tight end on offense. All right. Uh, now, uh, for fantasy fans out there, uh, just want to, and and including, uh, there's a lot of drafting going on right now, rookie drafting for dynasty leagues and then uh, regular drafting will be coming up soon as well before you know it, but taking a look, uh, First, uh, there's not much to talk about with the rookies, so obviously we're not going to really zero in there. But just um, if you had to talk about some of the younger players, uh, Jerome Ford uh, had a nice year last year. uh, So he's somebody that um, had some nice underlying stats as well that I noticed doing some research. Um, You take a look uh, at Hines. It's about keeping him healthy. It'll be interesting to see how he fits as a returner and what his role is going to be. Uh, yeah, Pierre Strong. So talk about maybe some of the g- – give me like a young player or two that any fantasy fans out there uh, that are going to be drafting, uh, f- you know, for their regular drafts coming up uh, this year. Who should they be keeping an eye on? Who's a nice uh, maybe under-the-radar player to, player to watch? Well, I think um, under the radar because he hasn't been a top player maybe perceived. So I would think in fantasy – I think a guy like Jerry Judy, they have big plans for him. And okay. if they're running the spread offense, I think Deshaun Watson's going to throw the ball a lot, and he's the number two guy. Yep. I know last year Elijah Moore was supposed to be the, you know, get a lot, and they tried early, but they couldn't really get it going as the gadget guy. But you didn't really have another option other than Cooper. And so I think they – by the money they paid Judy in the after signing him and what I have heard and talking to people in the organization, I really think they feel he's ideally fit for what they want to do here. We'll see. But yeah. Naeem Hines also, they looked at him as primarily a returner because of the value. But keep an eye on him early in the season as the back coming out of the backfield. You don't have Nick Chubb probably, even though – I was told he's got a target to be ready for the opener. I think they'll they'll really err to the side of caution as they should, and he'd probably start out on the pup list. And if they could get him back even by midseason, 
for the stretch run, I think would be ideal. So you could, if you can stash a guy away, that would get be a guy I would stash away. But Naeem Hines, I think until then, could be your short yardage swing passes out of the backfield because the other guy, Dante Foreman, is going to take more of the Kareem Hunt role. Now, Kareem Hunt had 11 touchdowns counting the playoffs. That's true. So, so he could be somebody under the radar. But I think Hines might be in there on the third down if it isn't Jerome Ford, if you're not sold that Jerome Ford's going to be the every down guy. So they're going to do it more by committee, but you could stash a Chubb down for late in the year. But I also think that Hines could be somebody un- sneaky, you know, Okay. in pass catching. But keep an eye on Jerry Judy, you know, as probably the best bet, I would say. Okay. And uh, Chubb's injury, even though it was early in the season, uh, what's the reason why he's not ready for the start of the season? Was it, uh, it, it sounds like to me then it was a more serious injury than the average. And I'm just, and I know Hall's a little younger and different body type, and it was probably a different injury. Um, and I'm just thinking about Brees Hall. Um, and he was injured later in the year, and then yet he came back ready to go once the season started. So what's the reasoning behind Chubb not being ready more than likely for the start of the season? Oh, this was considered a career ending injury. I mean, Minka Fitzpatrick hit him with his helmet on his knee and the knee went the opposite way that it's supposed to, you know, you can only lift your knee to straight. It went all the way up and he tore every ligament in there. The ACL, the MCL, Wow. you know, PCL. He had the same injury though at Georgia and they said his career was probably over and he came back the next year and played in the first game, and he ended up being a high second-round pick by the Browns, even despite the injury. But So it's to the same leg, the same injury, and, you know, you just question coming back. His career average, Greg, is 5.3 yards per carry. There's no question in my mind he'll be back on the field this year. Okay. But will he be 5.3 yards or will it be like 3.1? And that's so true. that's he's 28, 29 years old. If anybody can do it, it'll be him. Now, I did see a video of him running yesterday and, and lifting his knee um, high, uncorroborated. The person talking to him said he said his goal was to be ready for the first game. I don't think if he was ready, they'd play him in the first game. But – it was in the second quarter of the second game of the season. So it was early September, but this is a very devastating injury. Yeah. And, but because the Browns didn't address the running back position in free agency higher, that told me they felt good about him because there was several top tier free agents and they're trying to win a Super Bowl now. And the most I was told they offered was a one-year deal to Zach Moss. He went to the Bengals on a two-year. Most of those backs, they wanted more than one year. And I think if you would have offered more than one year, you would have been signaling to Nick Chubb, we're done with you, we're moving on. So they got Foreman on a prove-it deal, Naeem Hines, basically the same thing, and they have Jerome Ford. So. We don't know what we're going to get from him when you see him. Yep. But if there's anybody I would not bet against, it's Nick Chubb. And I think they'll be very careful with him. But if you can shoot him back into the offense, even at 75, 80%, he'd be the best back you have on the team. And that would be for the stretch run playoffs when you really need him. So um, that's the reason, okay. the timetable. But, yeah, the start of the season would be a year. And you had guys last year, Taki Taki, you know, tore his ACL in December, and he started training camp on time and wasn't even on the pup list. But this was much – this actually – they repaired the MCL like in October. They had to wait a month. And then they didn't do the the ACL until about a month later. Okay until like November. So it wasn't like they got 
they had to wait for swelling and determining okay. and all that kind of medical stuff on what to do with him. Okay. And by the way, uh, you didn't mention Pierre Strong once. Is that is that by accident or is that because uh, he really is deep buried in the depth chart? And well, uh, yeah, um, yeah, they've got. I think ultimately, if you didn't have Nick Chubb, no, Andrew Barry didn't draft Nick Chubb. All the running backs he's brought in have been third day or undrafted. I think it's future going to be by committee. Pierre Strong did have a burst, did have some time. He got injured a couple times, played on special teams. But I think he's in the mix to battle with, you know, with with Ford, yeah. Foreman, Hines, Strong. It, I think whoever is the guy that gets to be in the third down back is really the guy I was pointing to to be maybe a – you know, a fantasy sleeper, you know, okay. I'm thinking it's Heinz because, Makes sense. Um, you know, that's what he's done in the past. Yep. And Foreman's been more a tackle to tackle strong. You know, we didn't see him much in the passing game. If he can beat out strong or forward or something like that. Yeah. Okay. I think anything can happen. All right. Uh, and then uh, let's close with uh, a, a look at the schedule. So uh, it's good timing. Because the schedule came out yesterday. Let me uh, pop up the schedule here and uh, take a look at it. Let's see where it is. Okay. So, uh, wow. Well, that, that's, that's a hell of a week one matchup. That's, uh, that's pretty significant. Uh, taking on the Dallas Cowboys week one. What did you think about the schedule? You mentioned it was pretty tough. It is. By going last year's strength, the schedule, I think it's the toughest in the NFL. I think it's. 0.547 uh, winning percentage. So I think overall the, the teams all have winning records. It, it doesn't help when you're in the AFC North when three went to the playoffs and all four had winning records. <laughs> yeah. You're playing in them six of your 17 games are in yeah. the division. And like I said, you could make a case first to fourth for any of the teams. A lot of it comes down to injuries and so forth. But, yeah, you start out with the Cowboys – and then you go to Jacksonville. Um, you play four of your first five games away. Um, or, I mean, after the opener, four of the next five away. And so, but those are maybe, uh, if you perceive it now, some of your away games early are not the strongest teams. True. Jacksonville, Raiders, Commanders, even in Philadelphia, probably the toughest. You don't start your... AFC North until week seven. In recent years, they've opened against the Bengals or the last year they opened with the Bengals and the Steelers and the Ravens were in the fourth week. Um, this year, you don't start the division to week seven and then you play the Bengals and the Ravens at home. And so you have three in the road in a row and then three at home on the road. And then you get a bye. First time they had a, a, a middle of the season by last year, it was in the fourth week. Okay. The year before it was in the 13th week. So the second half of the schedule looks to be rougher right now. So I think you really have to make hay in the early part of the season. And in the NFL, sometimes if you get on a roll, it carries you. I think there's no way they, no reason they couldn't be four and two going into the division I agree. And then when you play the Bengals and the Ravens and Chargers at home, if you could win two out of those three, you know, you could be six and three at the at the break. And that puts you right in great shape. You know, even six or five and four isn't the end of the world. You know how it is in the NFL. But going in the second half, yeah, you, you have four primetime games. Yeah, that's a and lot. And they're, they're right now four of them you know, are in the final seven weeks. Yeah. And that's not mentioned in the final game against the Ravens could be flexed to a primetime game. So they could have five of their final seven on Thursday or Monday or Sunday. Two of them are on Thursday night, which isn't great, but they're both in the division with the Steelers and the Bengals. So it's a daunting schedule. <laughs> but like we said, you know, everybody's dealing with this 
Thursday night football this year. There's Wednesday night football. They didn't get it because of the Christmas. So they're fortunate there. And they also dodged a bullet. They didn't have to go overseas. They were supposed to rumor to go to Brazil. Then they were rumored to go to London to play the Jaguars. And so they dodged both those bullets and, and so, and they don't really have a West Coast game like they had two of them last year. Farthest they go is to Denver on a Monday night game. So, I mean, all things said, it sets up for them to get off to a good start, and then anything can happen. Yeah, and, and again, the Chiefs. So, basically, uh, the AFC West, that's the main uh, – and the AFC East. Those are the two divisions that the Browns are getting this year. And I guess the, the outliers are the, the Dolphins and the Saints. Those are the well, the Dolphins outliers. is on December 29th in Cleveland on Sunday night football. So the Dolphins have kind of folded late in the season the last couple of years to some sure. extent. And you hope Tua, you know, maybe doesn't want to really play on a December 29th in Cleveland <laughs> yeah. with the winds off the lake. Cold. So yes. I know his stats haven't been that great you know, in those games. So, yeah. um, Yeah. But yeah, two prime time games at home. Yeah. The Dolphins, the Saints and the Jags, actually, those are the three outliers besides the, uh, uh, the, the East East and the uh, West from uh, the AFC. All right. So that is going to wrap it up. Uh, I've taken more than enough of your time today here uh, and I know you've got to run, Fred. So I really appreciate it, as always. Uh, and anybody out there that wants to follow follow you, of course, uh, you've got at actually have the um, your Twitter handle, which is uh, is it just at Fred Greetham nine, the number nine, correct? Yep, right on the screen, right yep. there somewhere. Yeah, um, and uh, also, of course, uh, you are. Do you have your own show, by the way, that you do with uh, that you that you have scheduled, or do you just pop up yeah. and do the shows? OB, OBR weekly every Wednesday night at seven o'clock Eastern on Twitch, YouTube, or now as well on X. So we had a thousand on there last night for our schedule launch, over a thousand, and uh, so join the fun. We talk. Year round, every Wednesday night, we recap what happens with the Browns and what's going on. So t- check it out. Thanks, Fred. Appreciate it. We'll talk next uh, right around training camp. Sounds good, Greg. Thanks for having me. You got it. All right, Fred.